Hi, I'm Amy Cardoso and welcome to Art This Week. On this week's episode, we visit the Nasher Sculpture Center and our interviewer, Linda Mao, speaks with artist Tom Sachs about his exhibition, Tom Sachs Tea Ceremony. Now for Art This Week. Mal, and today I'm at the Nasher Sculpture Center speaking with Tom Sachs about his exhibition and recent body of work, Tea Ceremony. Tom, thank you so much for speaking with me. Today. Thanks for having me. This exhibition, you've created a Japanese garden inside the Nasher Sculpture Center and populated it with objects and uh, structures such as a tea room. But what are some of the other objects in the exhibition that might be a little less recognizable? Well, there's, a, there's some everyday objects here. There's a brancusi everyday object. Um, <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's a shotgun. There are some symbols of American um, imperialist culture, the United States sign in, in the font that's used on the side of spaceships and military um, ships. There's um, a Faraday cage for confiscating your cell phone and an airplane laboratory. There's even a Daisu, which means like, um, uh, like a shrine of expensive tea stuff but it's, it's, it's populated by a machete and a circular saw and other um, tools for excavating materials. I also want to ask you a little bit about what it was like, the differences between organizing the exhibition here and organizing the exhibition at the Noguchi. So at the Noguchi, it was a real collaboration with the ghost of Osamu Noguchi, um, with Dakin Hart as his medium. So we had a, a vibrant, antagonistic, passionate, arguments every day about mm -hmm. the virtues of one thing or another and it was a huge give and take and and, and um, uh, they can really help bring things to the next level. He had ideas that way exceeded my own and and that's also been the case here at the Nasher with Jed Morris. He has had such um, magical restraint and has prevented me from doing all kinds of stupid things and has helped this really mm -hmm. um, help each and every individual object in this exhibition shine from the permanent collection to the things in this room and how they connect. And how do you see these objects functioning um, if, if they were to be separated from each other? Do they still work or does it need to be this immersive experience? Well, I, I make an effort for everything to be able to stand on its own. I mean that Brancusi could be a carn or a road sign or a marker or a stilo or something that, that, that um, is a symbol of power or a monolith calling astronauts from another planet. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and every single thing in here could have another life. These trays that are called smut trays, Saks modularized utility tray, mm -hmm. have everything from a tea ceremony set in it to a, a game mm -hmm. to a battery charger. And these, and, and uh, we're installing them in the, tea, in the Mizuya in the water room and and the director's office is a backup Mazuya, <laughs> and we have them in the studio as shelves. And I'm even building a place in my closet of my apartment in New York so that these smuts can slide into them, so I can have a portable smut system. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty excited about that. <laughs> and in addition to the environment that you've created here, there's also a performative aspect to this this exhibition. Can you tell me a bit about the performance and what that entails? Well, all of this stuff here is to support the tea ceremony. My tea ceremony is based on the traditional tea ceremony as developed by Senno Rikyu 500 years ago as he and feudal Japanese people stole it, it from the Chinese and amplified and made it Japanese in the same way that this, this Chinese tradition was modified and, and changed culturally um, by the Japanese monks. It was brought to a new level to represent Japanese culture, but on the foundation of Chinese culture. Um, I've taken this Japanese tradition and amplified it through the lens of, or the speakers of my studio and of my space program. So all of this is born out of our space program um, and our mission to Mars in 2012 at the Park Avenue Armory in New York City, where the first two people walked on the surface of Mars. Um, they had a little conflict. They went to the tea house. They kind of came to terms with each other. And you can see that in detail in our movie, A Space Program. It's on iTunes. <laughs> you can rent it. So I can see a lot of ways that 
some of the, the themes in your work carry through from the mission to Mars. Are there a lot of visual markers of that as well? Well, you can see the Mars stones, Mars rocks, and the koi pond. Mm -hmm. These are maybe some of these are from Mars, and some of them are from Europa, the icy moon of Jupiter, where we went last year at Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. Um, you can see equipment that was used on Mars, um, a, a tea house uh, above the door to the um, to the tea house is a shotgun. Mm -hmm. um, the, the tea house door is small and square, so you have to get on your hands and knees and crawl in as an act of humility. But it's also narrow, so you can't go in with your sword. You have to leave your sword on the outside because traditionally, and I still believe this, because a lot of the traditions hold true that we, we keep going. We make our own up and add, but it's, it's, if it's built on, on foundation mm -hmm. of tradition, it's got solid feet. Is the um, idea is that what happens in the tea house stays in the tea house. <laughs> um, it's a room of diplomacy and of sensuality and meditation. So if you and I are, are um, you know, let's say we're, um, we're leaders of different parts of Japan and we're in a feud and we have tea together to discuss our differences, we might have to settle them on the battlefield, but neither of us are going to die in that room. Right. So it's like a, it's a place of diplomacy. Mm -hmm. And um, so there's a rack sometimes outside where the swords are hung. And in this case, we have a shotgun over the door. But that shotgun is there not just because we're in Texas, but because we're Americans. And one of the opportunities that I have is to embrace the um, imperialistic aspect of being an American. Um, you know, the first thing you do when you go into a new land as, as an invader is you show up with a Bible and a shotgun and tell them how it's going to be. Mm -hmm. That's what Europeans did when they first started developing this land into this whatever it is now. And um, I didn't want to miss that opportunity to re represent that because that's a part of the history of my people is exploitation. That's what we've done. I don't want to come in here and pretend like that didn't exist. So I want to talk a bit about some of the elements that you've brought in from a traditional Japanese garden because you've certainly you know, made the space your own and created this environment. But I think that if you pay attention, you can see all these little things that you've brought in that respect the tradition of Japanese gardening. Yeah. Among them, I, I like to think of the concept of miniaturization mm -hmm. um, as one of the main tenets of the Japanese garden. And you said in an earlier talk, you were talking about how the the cinder block represents Mount Fuji in a yeah, way. Yeah. And I loved that because I thought about how in a traditional Japanese garden, like a rock could represent a mountain. Um, is that the direct connection you're trying to make there? I love miniaturization. <laughs> I always have. Mm -hmm. um, if you look, a telescope and a microscope are the same tool. Mm -hmm. And as you look into the cosmos, they have the same structure as you, as you look into an atom. They're both got something powerful in the middle that creates energy that drives the things around it. And that's that, that, that an atom and a solar system are the same in, in, under that description. And the art, the traditional art of Japan is so magnificent because we all know it's a small country and, and every square foot is organized. Um, but unlike the island of Manhattan where it's all just a bunch of disgusting money-driven pile of shit and there's no care for anything other than the next project which is why it's great to work there <laughs> um, in Japan there's such a respect for mm -hmm. nature mm -hmm. and um, yeah I mean I, I love the cinder block because it's a reduced form mm -hmm. it's it's the dumbest thing that exists um, and so it's it's the symbol of our space program or our tea ceremony in this case um, and we have countless examples of that kind of miniaturization and obsession. And uh, you know, one of the things I'd hope beyond the politics of this is that you would get to look at the, the individual screws. These mm -hmm. are very um, rare, special um, stainless steel miniature screws that are really strong. And, or the, mar the pencil marks are where mm -hmm. these two pencil lines interact. That's a hallmark of your work, the, the, the artist's hand. You want to show the act of making in the object. And I thought that was a really interesting juxtaposition with uh, you have this gorgeous cast bronze bonsai tree, mm -hmm. and I just thought that was fascinating, the play with the traditional bonsai, which is, does everything it can to conceal its making, 
uh, versus your version of it, which does everything it can to sort of to show it's naked. So there on the bonsai you see Q-tips and um, tampon plungers and enema nozzles and toilet paper tubes all hot glued together and you see the glue drips and mm -hmm. you see the evidence and you see these things are used and, and worn. And um, you know, it's, it's ironic with bronze because there's a lot of faking going on to make it look real. Yeah. But in everything else that isn't bronze, it is, it is real. And, and if you look, go and see the Brancusi's large red cock, you'll see both. You'll see the original and the faking of it and you can find, tease the line back and forth. And I think those kinds of contradictions are interesting and what makes it art. You know, the iPhone has no art in it because it's, it, it is a pure successful expression of perfection in its way. When something goes wrong with it, it's not, there's no virtue to that. There's no Zen moment of, oh, that's so, you know, human. You're yeah. just annoyed. Yeah. Um, and that product's great because it, all things considered, things go wrong well. yeah. not that often considering yeah. what considering it does. Considering the piece of technology yeah. you hold in your pocket. Yeah, right. and how quickly it's evolved. Mm -hmm. And so since you brought in Brancusi, another yeah. thing that I love about this exhibition is so you have this environment, which is the, the Japanese garden and the tea ceremony exhibition. And next door in the next gallery over, you've been able to participate in the Nasher's Foundation series yeah. that includes um, pieces from the Nasher's permanent collection that you've curated uh, to, to correspond a little bit to your work. And this great um, vista, I would call it, through the exhibition shows this totem, for lack of a better word, of your making, and that you can see beyond it the Brancusi's kiss that it sort of directly relates to. And that comes back to, I'm assuming you did it on purpose, this element of borrowed landscape from Japanese gardening. There's a um, word yeah, that yeah. I don't know how to pronounce. Sure. But it's about creating these vistas and borrowing scenery from the exterior to bring it into the garden. We, I think, we try to do that as best we could. I mean, I'm like a hillbilly caveman. <laughs> at this, but we tried to create some foreshortening and this is through in this area in particular with the koi pond and, and there's a stupa that you can see outside of the window that could be inside and, and the, certainly that Brancusi stone could be outside and, and we we're trying to connect all these things. In fact, if you look this way, you kind of see that, that path. This is actually a pretty good photo. I have to take a picture from my scrapbook of that. But it's been a real honor to to curate the exhibition and to show some of the works that have inspired me. How did you get into ceramics? So when we did our space program Mars in 2012, um, my friend J JJ Pete said, shame on you. <laughs> and I was like sighing because I was so tired from the space program. And he said, what do you mean shame on you? And he said, well, when you did your tea ceremony, I saw that you, the bowl that they used was something that you bought. And it's true, I bought a white ceramic Raku bowl and I engraved NASA on it. And I said, well, I was a little busy running my space program, JJ. What do you expect me to make the bowl? And he said, damn straight. And I was like, well, I don't know how to make a ceramic bowl. That's like a whole art. And he said, well, come to the 92nd Street Y and I'll teach you. And I was like, what do you mean? And he's like, well, didn't you know that I'm a ceramics master? And little did I know that this old friend of mine who I'd known for eight years, who worked in the studio for a while, was um, a ceramics master, has a degree in ceramics and is a teacher at the Y. So I started taking classes at the 92nd Street Y and I started making ceramics under his tutelage. And then years later, five years later, JJ Pete, Mary Fry and Pat McCarthy and I formed Satan Ceramics, which was kind of like a knitting circle. We all <laughs> sit around and complain about our friends and our relationships and make ceramics and eat Thai food and um, we've done a couple of shows and we're always working on a new one. So in so many ways this project goes beyond what we're able to see here in the ways you just said. Um, we can't, a visitor to the Nasher couldn't possibly see each smut you know on their visit. So what does you that mean? You mean because of time? You? Because of time yeah, yeah, and sure. because of concealment? I mean how, how um, interactive are visitors supposed to be with your tea house? Well, it's a problem. <laughs> it's a problem. In my view, if you're he if I'm here and you're here, you can touch everything. Mm -hmm. I've got an awesome set of tools in the basement. <laughs> you can't damage anything um, that I can't fix. Of course, people are like water and they will find every crack and every little gap and eventually mm -hmm. things are damaged. So because of the volume of people, people can't touch stuff. We make sure that everything is on display as much as possible. The book, the, the tea ceremony manual, has some um, windows into the secrets. The movie, I don't know if you've been able to see it yet, yeah. but 
it, it'll be online this week and you can see it today later here in the Nasher. It's 10 minutes long and it shows all of these things in the um, in use because all of these things are um, you know they're function they're 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 sculptures but without the history of their use they you know without the utility they don't they lack spirit mm -hmm. so um, the movies are there to show the aspects of the sculptures that exist in time and it's a compromise but the other side of that is like you know one side you want everyone to see everything but on the other side of it you're creating an occult experience or we have a thing that's part of our studio and it's very internal and intimate so you can't simultaneously have a, a private intimate moment between two right. people and have everyone in the world see it it turns mm -hmm. into like pornography or something <laughs> but um, these are these are contradictions and problems that we have and, and so the movies are a way of showing some of that and the books and zines and even this interview or Instagram is a way of like sharing that. I also wanted to ask you about how this exhibition sort of raises the in inevitable question of, of cultural appropriation and whether or not this particular subject matter is your purview as a white male artist. Yeah. Uh, would you like to speak to that? Yeah, so um, <laughs> You know, there comes a time in every middle-aged white guy's life where he discovers that Japan is where it's at. <laughs> and that's why there are so many Zen gardens and koi ponds. This entire project is my midlife Japanophile crisis um, expression. <laughs> I'm going to use my artistic and sculptural prowess to investigate this mm -hmm. phenomenon that I've seen widespread. For me, the, you know, being a student of Japanese culture and amplifying it through the speaker of my studio or through the lens of my studio is a way of me adapting and improving. And I, th I think, you know, it's, you know, there, there are the four tenets of the tea ceremony, you know, tranquility, harmony, hospitality, and, and respect. And respect is the main thing. And I, if you can respect someone else's culture and fully immerse yourself mm -hmm. in it, you're not um, you're not exploiting it, but you're bringing it to the next level. And to quote Noguchi, he believed in the in the, the true development of traditions. Mm -hmm. It's not innovating for for fun. It's innovating because you need to. Um, it's not innovating because you can, but it's because you're trying to bring this thing to the next level and you're part of a continuum. Well, thank you so much yeah. for speaking with me today, <laughs> Thank you. Tom. Thanks I really for appreciate question. it. We want to thank Tom for speaking with us. For more information on the exhibition, go to nashersculpturecenter.org. That's it for us this week. Thanks for watching. I still got your polo